Welcome to the Creators here at Sun City. Coming to you every Tuesday and Friday. Extended conversations that build community making for creators videos, by art making what you make. Today on The Creators, Kevin Healy, a songwriter and musician who and then made his way here to our Seacoast. So subscribe to our channel, comment, and most importantly, watch Building With Us as we build community with you. Hi everybody, welcome back to uh, The Creators. We are here at Sum City Studios in beautiful downtown Summersworth, New Hampshire. And with us today, uh, our guest is a musician uh, named Kevin Healy, uh, who lives uh, over in Durham, New Hampshire. And uh, Kevin, welcome to The Creators. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> it, it is beautiful here. It is. It's, it's a, the most beautiful town I've ever seen. It's a lovely place. Uh, it was <laughs> rainy today, but you know, we need the rain, so <laughs> it's okay. Um, so, you know, I've, I've had the pleasure of hearing a number of your original musical creations. Um, <clears throat> but I don't know that much about your, your background in music. Mm -hmm. Except that you, these songs that I've heard more recently are, are not the first ones that, that you have uh, created. Tell us about the, you know, when did you first get started in, uh, in writing your own songs? I got a guitar, this one right here. I got this acoustic guitar. My dad took me to Stewart's Music Shop in Lansdale, Pennsylvania, when I was 16. And I picked this one out, and uh, I got blisters on my fingers learning how to play it. And, um, and it was immediate that I was trying to write original material. Did, did you yell, I've got blisters on my fingers, and then knock something over? Yeah, you know. That's, uh, that's, so I think that's, I heard that somewhere. standard. You have so. to do that. You have to do that. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. <laughs> the Beatles setting another trend. Um, so you could thank my dad if you like the songs. Thank him for... It was 175 bucks. It's a Fender Acoustic. Bought it when I was 16. Wow, what a deal. <laughs> it, and um, so then from there... It, you started, did you have your own band or uh, where did you take it from? Uh, I was started working with my friend Chaz, Chaz Cleland. Uh, he was my best friend in high school and through college and we worked together. Uh, he had written some lyrics and poetry and I had written some chord progressions and we got together and it just worked. So we did a number of lo-fi, low-tech albums, terrible production on a an analog four track, um, you know, that, that were self-produced. And he was sort of a cartoonist, so he drew cute little pictures. One of the songs was called Dance Rabbit, which is a line from Bugs Bunny. So he drew a little terrified little rabbit under a spotlight who looked like we were shouting at him, Dance Rabbit. So, <laughs> so Chaz is a huge part of my musical biography, autobiography. And the the Dance Rabbit song, <laughs> you, you didn't sing that in Elmer Fudd's no, voice. No, uh, well, if I were to go back and re-record it, you know, for a 20-year yeah. anniversary, that would be the thing to do, clearly. 20 years ago. So this is a, you were you were part of a sort of 90s kind of underground band. I said underground in the bedroom. Yeah. Bedroom, bedroom band. Yeah. Nobody listened to our stuff. Nobody. <laughs> we, would, we would record them on cassette tapes. We would ma you know, mass produce them, meaning we'd have five or six copies, and we'd have to force them into people's hands, and our friends would tell us that it's okay. <laughs> and, and yet you persisted. And yet we persisted. Uh, yeah. So what we, is it about the, that sort of creative process that... Uh, we got some gigs. Okay. All right. So some people did hear it. We got on the local radio station at the Montgomery County Community College. Um, we did some gigs at the local uh, senior citizens' home. <laughs> and then later we played at bars. So later on, uh, skipping forward a few years, I was in grad school at Rutgers University. And so New Brunswick, New Jersey has a kind of local music scene, which is not bad. And um, <clears throat> so I played with uh, Chaz a little bit, but I also found some local musicians there that I should tell you about, Vance Van and Bob Morkovich. 
uh, and we became a band called Heavy Medicine. And we were named by Spook Handy as the best new band of 1998 or something in New Brunswick. Uh -huh. So I've got that on my CV. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> my musical CV. That's impressive. So Ch Chaz was a little bit jealous. So at this point in your, your uh, creative history, let's, let's call it, um, who, who did you consider your influences? Uh, at, that, at that point? Yeah. Um, it was always the Smiths that were my biggest influence. Um, Johnny Marr as a guitarist is still amazing. He just put out a new album called The Comet. I ordered the deluxe version that has the vinyl and the cassette nice. and the CD and a signed picture of him. Wow. Uh, see, he's still pumping out stuff. And of course, Morrissey was the singer. He's still pumping out stuff. Uh, unfortunately, he's also pumping out like politically incorrect nonsense on some of his video, uh, his <laughs> video interviews and wherever else, right. but I still love him. Mm -hmm. um, Elvis Costello, Pink Floyd, The Beatles, and uh, more recently, Rufus Wainwright. But around that time, it was still the Smiths who were the primary influence. You know, not, not to jump ahead, but uh, since you just mentioned Elvis Costello, uh, I've noticed that with your, with your more recent songs that you've written, uh, like Elvis Costello, you, they have this lyrically, this, this sort of literary yeah. quality to them. Yes. Um, and, you know, what, what inspires that? Uh, is that just how you prefer to communicate in the musical genre? Do you mean the more recent songs? So I have three new songs I just recorded within the last like three months maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and those are maybe a little more literary because they're based on uh, poems that I had written, which I did not intend to be recorded as a lyric to a song. Uh, so that might explain some of that. I had sat down my guitar, all of my guitars, and my bass guitar for eight, ten years while I was working on a PhD and getting a job and getting tenure and raising uh, my now sweet 11-year-old daughter, Madeline, and being married to my lovely wife, Christina. So I'd set it all down, but when I picked it back up again after getting tenure or feeling like I was fairly confident in getting tenure, I had a new process, um, and I'd been writing a lot of poetry, so I had a set of poems, and at some point I thought to myself, when I'm writing these poems, I, I'm hearing a rhythm. I'm writing them to a rhythm in my head. Uh, this is just a technique that I use when I'm writing poetry, that every line has to have a rhythm to it, a cadence to it, and it has to lead into the next with a certain rhythm. And so I thought to myself, surely these could make good lyrics, or maybe they'll make good lyrics. Uh, so the three songs that I just recorded this summer, spring, summer, um, are, were all originally written as poems that I did not intend to use as song lyrics, but I think they worked out pretty well. So that might explain Absolutely. why they have a little more of a literary feel to them. In fact, uh, we're going to play one of them now. If you'd give us an introduction to this first song, uh, you know, what's the name of it, uh, maybe what inspired you to, uh, uh, to write the song, and then when we're back, I want to talk to you about sort of the technical aspect okay. of, uh, of doing your uh, songwriting. Uh, let's listen to A Mason Jar first. This is the most recent song that I recorded, so I always am most fond of my most recent piece. <laughs> So I suppose we should start with that one. And I, I like this song a lot because the imagery in it is, I think, um, it's concrete and yet it's suggestive. So it's my, it's my current favorite. Stop. 
That was Mason Jar uh, by our guest Kevin Healy, a musician who is here with us today on The Creators, right here in Sun City Studios in beautiful downtown Summersworth, New Hampshire. So I think there's an interesting process from a technical standpoint in terms of your uh, songwriting. You know, uh, can you take us through? You know, how you go about, uh, because you play all of the instruments and you right. do the vocals and the whole thing. Right? Yes, the only instrument that I don't play is the drum track. So I use a, a loop. I use studio recorded drums, but I use a loop. Um, but I do bass guitar, I do the acoustic and electric guitars, I do all the vocals, I do sometimes additional percussion like shakers or whatever, things like that. Um, a mason jar, I started with the lyric. But what I think is interesting is that my favorite part of the song that we just heard is the chorus. But the original poem slash lyric, the chorus was not in there. It's actually two choruses. There's two. The second is a variation, the kind of flip side of the first. And those were not in the original poem. So I had the original poem called The Mason Jar. And the way I started the songwriting process is that I, I heard a basic melody from the first line. So the first line is uh, in a would-be hipster's mason jar. So I just thought, okay, what is the rhythm there? In a would-be hipster's mason jar. That's what I heard. I just heard that. Okay, that's where I start. And so I picked up the guitar and I started, okay, what key is that? I'm hearing it in a certain key. Da -da -dum 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 -dum. Okay, if I were gonna put, uh, so I got kind of a bass line or a riff to that. What chords go with that? Okay, well, it's somewhere, I think it's an A major or something like that, or A minor, one of those, somewhere around there. Um, I associate, incidentally, this is a kind of a footnote, a tangent we could get back to if you like, but I have mild synesthesia, so I associate colors with certain chords. So when I'm thinking about this song, A Mason Jar, I'm seeing the color yellow because I think it's in the key of A, which to me is yellow. Okay, end footnote. So back to <laughs> the first lyric. So then I started this process um, and I had a number of chords and then I thought, okay, something's missing here. I had a chord progression, I had a first part, I had a kind of second part and then I thought, I need something else. There should be a chorus to this. What is the chorus? So I did a little bit of a faster variation. So in the verse, there's um, four beats of F major and then four beats of, uh, you know, a full measure of uh, C major. So I just sped that up a bit. I did half, half a measure of F major, half a measure of C. So it's a little bit faster. And I thought, okay, now what? And then I, I hit a, an E minor, and I thought, ah, I did E minor to D minor seven, I think is what it is. And I thought, this is it. And in fact, I haven't used an E minor at all in, in any of the other parts of the song. So it's especially great that it's, now I'm introducing that in the chorus, because it adds this color texture that wasn't there previously. Mm -hmm. So when I heard that, then when I got the E, e minor to D, minor seven in the chorus, then I heard the melody for that. Um, in a mason jar, in a mason jar. I heard that, I thought, okay, that's gonna work. I'll put some harmonies on it. And then I thought, um, I probably should have a pre-chorus, something leading into that. So I came up with, um, can I play a, a little, I can yeah, play a little do. piece for it. Sure. Usually what I'll do is I'll get the... Um, I'll get one part of it as a chord progression, and then I'll think, I can't just be keep doing that chord progression over and over. I need something else. So I'll, it has, But it should be in a related key or the same key.
came up with that. So that this is the kind of thing, incidentally, that that probably comes from Johnny Mars. Yeah. If you look at his YouTube video for how he wrote Heaven Knows I'm Miserable Now, there's a lot mm -hmm. of open strings, open chords there. In fact, his hand positioning is very similar in that. In that. So they have a lot of, a lot of uh, strings that I just keep playing open while I'm moving my fingers around. So I liked that a lot, but I thought, how am I going to use that? Wow, maybe I'll use that as a pre-chorus going into the chorus, going out of the chorus. So I put that all together, the verse, um, and then I had a pre-chorus, something going in there, and then I had the chorus, which I liked a lot. I did all this on the acoustic first, and then I did a rough version of that, a rough rec recording of that, and then I picked up my bass guitar, um, and that's when I really kind of took off. And I find that this happens a lot, that when I pick up the bass guitar, the song will take on a really different feel. Um, in fact, so that piece, that little pre-chorus piece that I just played, it's very kind of atmospheric and soft if you're just playing it acoustically. Mm -hmm. um, but then when I picked up the bass to go underneath that, it was really funky. I found myself playing this really funky I thought, okay, that works. I like that. I originally had written a kind of now it seems to me like a kind of cliche bass riff um, or guitar riff to be the intro. And then I realized, no, the best part of the song is that bass line. So then I took that out in the mix and I, I took the bass line from this pre-chorus and I just took a few measures of that and stuck it at the beginning of the song. And I thought, that's it. That's my introduction. So. You know, it's, it struck me as kind of, uh, of, of the songs that you've written that I've heard before. Mason Jar struck me as, in a lot of ways, kind of the more complex, kind of really sophisticated uh, songs in a lot of different ways. And, and even the things that you did, I assume, probably in post-production, like the, the sound that you get for the lead guitar. You know, yeah. it, to me, it sounds like it's got that sort of uh, playing in a, 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 an auditorium uh, sound to it, you know, or a sort of live sound to it, which uh, I think thought really worked well, even though you've got kind of different sounds or right. sound qualities with other parts of the song. And the backing vocals on the chorus that you mentioned, uh, I think uh, I, uh, I mentioned to you uh, off camera, kind of remind me of, of uh, the, the squeeze, uh, the group squeeze. Yeah. You know, you've got Chris Difford with this really low kind of voice, you know, Mason, uh, and, and uh, Glenn Tilbrook, who always took the, the high end. You know, he's, Tilbrook was kind of, you know, Paul McCartney to Difford's Difford <laughs> yeah. because his voice was so low. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I just, there's so many different things about that song that I, I really like. I'm glad that you, that you liked it. Um, I, can, I can tell you a little bit. Um, I mean, I, the reference to Squeeze is very flattering, and I like it. And it's funny because Squeeze is one of those bands that I think is sort of in my subconscious, hmm. even though I've never bought one of their albums. Yeah. Same thing with Duran Duran, I think. I've been yeah. listening. I was listening to Duran Duran on Spotify, and I thought, you know, these guys are like way in there, <laughs> somewhere. Even though it's like you didn't have to buy their album because they're just all over the place and all over MTV, so it's in there. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I was thinking about. Uh, oh, so the the effect on the intro guitar solo, which is the same. It comes back later. Um, you can you can thank my I chose to upgrade from Cubase LE, which came with my uh, Yamaha MW10 mixing console. I, I upgraded, and that comes with so Cubase Elements 9.5 is the most recent one. I got a nice educational license, so it was a bit of a discount. It was only like 70 bucks, uh, but that comes with a whole suite of amp simulators. Oh, okay. So that's what you're hearing is a yeah a nice quality amp simulation. So I just had an electric going straight with a patch cord into this Yamaha mixing console, and then I ran it through, in Cubase, I ran it through a, an amp simulator. Cool, uh, I like the sound a lot. Um, before we go to the next song, I do want to come back to that, that colors, oh, colors and notes. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> I've okay. never heard about this, what, what yes. is that? 
Synesthesia is a, um, no, I was going to say it's a, it's a condition, but that makes it sound like it's some kind of disease. It's not. It's like, you know, it's a virtue. Synesthesia, it's a, um, a talent. It's a uh, characteristic that some people have that di different modes of perception are blended in ways that they usually aren't. So, and this is true of a lot of people. I don't have it as quite as strongly as some people, uh, but for example, when I think of your name, Tom Jackson, I, I, I see it in color. I see certain colors associated with the T in Tom and the J in Jackson. Yeah. So Extremely dark colors, I would imagine. No. They are rather dark, Tom. Okay. We could talk about that. All right. Uh, <laughs> <nice>. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've actually done readings with people. I'll sit with them and I'll say, here's the colors I see in your name. And here's, wow. now I know when I'm doing that that it's kind of bullshit, but, um, <laughs> but it's fun bullshit to do, you know. It can be productive to do that kind of thing. So, you'll, yeah. so it, in my synesthesia, I'll associate colors with numbers and with letters. So then, of course, when I'm playing an instrument, I'm thinking about the the uh, chord, so it might be an E minor, it might be an F major, it might be C, and there's always colors associated with that. So in the past, when I was in Drew at Drew University, I got into a kind of improv period where I'll, I recorded tracks with some friends of mine that were called um, reminiscent of Miles Davis, um, uh, like blue to green. Hmm. And it would start in a kind of, as a kind of modal piece in G major, because that to me is like green. And then it'll move to, you know, or green to yellow, and it'll move to A minor, which to me is yellow. So I have to explain this to the people I'm playing with. Okay, it's green, and then it's yellow. And they'll be like, okay, Kevin, <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> but, you know, it kind of works. It's yeah. just a different mood. And it's so... And some of it was blue, not just kind of blue, but blue. Right, yeah. yes. Yeah. A lot blue. That's how he was going to originally call that album, is a lot blue. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said, call it kind of blue. Yeah. Possibly the greatest jazz album of all time, but uh, I guess yes. that's, that's just a matter <laughs> of opinion. So we probably shouldn't. Oh, why not? Joke about it. You know, if Miles Davis was here, and you know, I used he'd to hang out with him ass. all the time. He'd kick our ass. You're right. He'd kick our ass. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's go to uh, let's go to another one of the new uh, songs. Okay. And which one uh, shall we listen to this time? Um, why don't we do "Timeless Souls Hesitate"? Because that one's a little. That's the most atmospheric one. I, in fact, I, when I'm trying to categorize these online in services like Submit To, uh, this is a platform where you can try to get it on blogs or whatever, I realized that this might be considered dream pop or shoegaze, mm. although I'd like to think I have a little more personality than, than that. I don't just, I'm not just staring at my shoes, but this one might qualify as that. It's very atmospheric. I have a lot of reverb on the vocals. Um, it's meant to be kind of psychedelic. It is very, yeah. It's definitely got the psychedelic quality to it and atmospheric. Um, and the title, you know, some people might think, that, oh, it sounds pretty heavy. Um, what inspired the, the lyrics? Well, that, that title and the full line that says, um, "Timeless soul, when timeless souls get stuck in time, they hesitate and second guess themselves. That, that line or lines, and I'm not kidding, this sounds cliche or something or contrived, but it's not. This came to me in a dream. I woke up in the middle of the night and I had this line in my head. Uh, when timeless souls get stuck in time, they hesitate and second guess themselves. And you can hear the rhythm to that. Um, and I thought, I need to do something with that. So I, so I wrote a poem out of that, Timeless Souls. When timeless souls get stuck in time, they hesitate and second-guess themselves. That was the first line. And I thought, OK, all right, I know people who are timeless souls. So I thought of a few, and I wrote it about that. Um, and then I kind of, again, I didn't intend for that to be the lyric of a song. And in fact, uh, this song is, there's two different poems. One was Timeless Souls Hesitate, and the other was 
was called Bonfires. So I realized that um, there wasn't quite enough material in the one uh, poem, so I drew from two different ones and pieced them together. So this was kind of, this is a much more iterative process, this one. Um, I could, I can play you the, the chord progression that I came up with first and tell you and show you how that works. Would you like to, right. can I do that? Yeah, let's do that before we, before we listen to the song. All right. Uh, so this is a case, this song was a case where, um, you know, this is how a lot of my, uh, how I come up with a lot of my chord progressions is I'll just grab the guitar and just come up with some arrangement um, on my, so I'll come up with some chord and I'll think, that's interesting, has a nice sort of color to it. So, so I came up with that, and I would just play it over and over again, and, I'll, and I would think, okay, now what? Now I need a different chord progression. So I added a little bit different of a thing down there. So then I knew I had a chord progression, and I thought, okay, I don't know what, I don't know what lyrics go with this. I don't know what poem might go with this. So I just laid it down on the multi-tracking on Cubase. I got that down, and then I just pulled out all my poems, and I thought, maybe this one, Timeless Souls Hesitate. That seems, you know, the mood of that chord progression is kind of atmospheric and the mood of the poem, so let's try that. So I just kind of waited until nobody was home and then started singing along, you know, improvising a vocal to that chord progression. Um, and that's how, uh, that's how that song started. All right. So let's uh, let's give a listen to uh, "When Timeless Souls Hesitate" right now by Kevin Healy. <laughs> Timeless Souls Hesitate, a uh, new song by Kevin Healy, who's a musician. Uh, he's here today with us on The Creators, coming to you from Sun City in beautiful downtown Summersworth, New Hampshire. So, what were the colors? You, you played that chord progression that ah. you came up with. Uh, what were the colors <laughs> of those chord progressions, of ah, those chords? That's a good question. Um, well, I think that there's a kind of, there's a drone there that's uh, A. Uh, so because it's in the key of A or A minor, it's, it's already sort of yellowish, but it's a little bit brown. It's very earthy. It's an earthy chord progression. Browns, yellows, warm tones. Hmm. Warm tone, yeah. Okay, I get that. All right. Um, so in the in that creative process, you know, as you've kind of explained how you came up with a couple of these, these songs that we've heard, um, it sounds to me like you don't, you don't always necessarily start with a chord progression or the music part of it and then add the lyrics uh, or, or vice versa. It's just kind of, you know, whichever, whatever inspiration comes to you first. I used to work um, the way you just suggested. I used to do a whole chord progression with verse and chorus and bridge and I'd get it all done uh, or mostly done the structure of it the chords and then I would have this sort of blank canvas and think okay now it needs a lyric and I would start from scratch a lyric that would go that I would write specifically for that chord progression 
Um, so, for example, a good example of that is there's a song, one of my favorite songs that was from quite a while ago, 2003, I think. It's called Scandal Lust. So that was one that I wrote it, all the chord progressions, uh, the, the entire chord progression, and then I added a lyric to it, which is about um, you know news propaganda and how people get sucked into um, uh, headlines that are sensational. So we have a lust for scandal and propping people up, celebrities, and then seeing them fall. So that was something that I had the chord progression, and then I thought, what, what's it going to be about? And I heard kind of a little bit of a melody, and I came up with some words that could hold that melody, and then it just developed from there. But these, the more recent songs that I've been writing, uh, it's a very different process. Um, so, and I like that. I like that I'm doing a different process. I like that it's, that I'm experimenting, changing things around. It's a different result. I mean, you could tell it's the same guy doing these songs, but there's something different about my songs now than about from Puppet Flags or from uh, Eddie Kite. And so, yeah, and like you said, that's kind of getting away from maybe the more formulaic uh, design or, or, or uh, framework. Um, you know, first chorus, first chorus, middle eight, first chorus, chorus, that kind of thing that we've all heard so many hundreds and hundreds of times. And, you know, one, one band that I thought maybe I've heard you know, at least a little bit of influence here and there, uh, that really was very instrumental and not at all shy about getting away from that sort of framework uh, was REM. Uh, and, you know, I mean, they <laughs> they completely abandoned uh, that whole sort of structure hmm. in many of their songs, especially mm -hmm. early, the, the earlier songs. Mm -hmm. um, were they a band that, uh, that you feel had any influence on your They did. Work? They did. I had, uh, I had a copy of Green on cassette tape, and I wore it down. Uh, they're a band that I, I don't, at this point, identify with strongly, mm -hmm. but I remember hearing Driver 8 and South Central Rain and thinking, I want to do that. That's what yeah. I want to do. That, that vocal style, that atmosphere, um, and Green, I think, is a really good album. There's a lot of good imagery in there. I still think of, I mean, that song, that album sort of defined f for me in my, cemented in my mind, the idea of a hair shirt, right? There's a song on there called Hair Shirt. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I'll hang my hair shirt from the lowest rung, or however it goes. Um, so there's some strong imagery, some weird, I just don't particularly, something about Michael Stipe rub, rubs me the wrong way. Oh. Which well, might be ironic coming from a guy who likes Morrissey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they were. Apparently they were good friends. Good friends, yes. Or, and then, you know, probably had a fallout. Uh, yeah, it happens. I'll tell you a funny story about that. You could All right. <laughs> leave it in or not. Let's, let's in hear. Morrissey's autobiography, he talks about uh, how he met Michael Stipe and how Michael Stipe came and visited Morrissey before they were on tour um, in England, I guess, and then and they were walking around town, and Morrissey's comment was, I walked around town with him all day, and then he went right into his concert without changing his clothes and without brushing his teeth. <laughs> and you could tell the way he, he didn't have to add the comment that, therefore, I am better than Michael Stipe. <laughs> That's what he meant. Like, when I go, and, you know, I, I shower and put on a new shirt and I brush my teeth. Yeah, you know? I think that was like his his wink to the audience. Like, I have enough respect for you to brush my teeth before I sing into the microphone for right. two hours. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. And this is what sets me apart from Michael Stipe. So there. Yes. <laughs> Interesting. I hadn't heard that story before. Right. That's, that's a good one. <laughs> um, so one of the things, you know, uh, by happenstance that has come up on the creators a number of times is that uh, 
uh, almost all of our guests thus far uh, have had parallel careers or at least somewhat of you know, uh, additional work uh, teaching oh. in some form. And you know, I don't need to uh, go into uh, you know a large amount of detail or anything, but uh, <clears throat> I've heard a rumor that you, uh, well, you mentioned earlier you're now tenured at the University of New Hampshire. Woohoo! All right, <laughs> and uh, it's in the communication department. Yes, yeah. I'm. I am now an associate professor of media studies. I had been an assistant which sounds like you're helping people move furniture or something, but now I'm an associate. So it's like, I'm almost running the business, but not quite. <laughs> so yes, I have tenure and I teach and I write things. Congratulations on that. Thank you. And uh, uh, you got your PhD at uh, University of Illinois urbana Yes, right. right. In fact, I was just there visiting my mentor, Cliff Christians, with my good, uh, colleague, friend, co-author Robert Woods. Uh, this past weekend I was there, yes, Urbana-Champagne. And you had some association, uh, I believe, back at that time with uh, the great Robert McChesney. Yes, Sorry. Robert McChesney, Bob McChesney, who famously or infamously had two cocktail shirts of, that were identical had little cocktails on them. That's impressive. <laughs> if I you hung out with him at one of his uh, you know, faculty parties. He Robert McChesney, in, in case viewers are, are wondering at all about this uh, fantastic uh, sort of media critic um, and critic of uh, uh, all mainstream media, not just, uh, uh, you know, what Fox News refers to as mainstream media. Um, and uh, I've read a lot of Robert McChesney's writing. Uh, if you're familiar at all with my documentary work, uh, a lot of it has to do with critiquing the media. Um, and he's, McChesney is also in Outfoxed. Ah, yes. Uh, which is, a, you know, a critique of Fox News that came out last decade sometime. Um, he's a rock star. He is a rock star, indeed. And uh, uh, brilliant. Then again, so is Cliff Christians. Hey, I'm sorry? Cliff Christians is also a rock star. Yeah? Yes, in his own way. <laughs> well, good. We, you would recommend, it. does he have a book you would recommend? Or um, all of them. All, all of Cliff Christian's yeah. books. All right. No, really, you have to meet him. These two okay. people, uh, Bob McChesney and Cliff Christians, are, are an odd couple to have on the same dissertation committee. They're very different personalities, and I, I won't get into how. Okay. <laughs> well, interesting to, to know. Maybe they should go on a little speaking tour, speaking and book signing tour or something like that together. Ah, uh, yeah, that won't happen. No. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> uh, we've got one more new song, and uh, tell us a little bit about this one. Okay. Uh, uh, this is Steam and Grind which my wife Christina said is a great name for a song. Uh, I, don't, I don't think she actually liked the song. Oh. <laughs> Not her favorite song of the ones I've... That can be kind of a red flag, can it? You know? Well... I love the title. Yeah. yeah. That's the, no, she really believed... Yeah, it is a good title, Steam and Grind. Uh, yeah. It sounds like it's going to be... And uh, so, no, Christina liked Coffee Stains, that whole set of jazz ballads. Mm -hmm. uh, Steam and Grind is, uh, I like this song because it's a little bit quirky, um, and yet it has some real depth to it. Um, and the core of it is an anecdote that is about uh, John Cage, the avant-garde composer John Cage, when he met uh, D.T. Suzuki, who's a a Zen master. Uh, so, so there's this moment where in, in his, um, John Cage did a recording called Indeterminacy, which is, includes some of his chance operations. So it's a strange thing to hear. It's his narration, the little stories, but you hear random sounds underneath it. And one of the stories that stuck out to me when I heard this 
uh, I studied John Cage as part of my work in uh, as an undergraduate at Drew University. He tells this story that he he was sitting and listening to a talk by D.T. Suzuki, this Zen master, and the window behind him was open, and he was near, I think it was in either Manhattan, someplace in New York City, and he was near LaGuardia Airport, if I'm getting this correct, I think I am, and so the airplanes would pass by behind him, So, but D.T. Suzuki would continue talking, knowing full well, apparently knowing full well, that people couldn't hear what he was saying well, as long as the airplanes were going by. And, and in this indeterminacy, John Cage says, I was straining to hear what Suzuki was saying, and then at some moment I had an epiphany that that was the point, that it's not the words, that that's not what I am to get from Suzuki. It's his being, it's his way of being, and that my focus on the words and trying to get them right and trying to understand is part of the problem. Boop. So that was his uh, sort of moment of whatever they call it, Satori. So this, this I, I translated to a kind of scene in a coffee shop where the, instead of a plane passing by, there's, there's the sound of the steam and grind of the, the ink-skinned servers. And yet, it's, so it's just about being with your friends in the coffee shop, and it's not so much what you're talking about, it's just being, being there. So it's kind of zen, but with a nice quirky riff to it. I like it. Zen, zen is good. <laughs> There's Steam and Grind by Kevin Healy. <laughs> Steam and Grind there by Kevin Healy, a musician who is with us here uh, on The Creators, here in the studios of Sum City in beautiful downtown Summersworth, New Hampshire. So let's let's talk about uh, let's talk about the future. Uh, it, are we in the process of seeing an album uh, come out here, or, or do you kind of not look at it that way? Do you well. See? I am looking at it that way. Uh, unfortunately, well, no, let me take that back. It's not unfortunate. Um, fortunately, I have many projects going on. I have also have a book project that I'm very excited about uh, with my colleague Robert that I mentioned, and Cliff Christians is going to write the uh, preface to it, um, and that's a set of proverbs about the digital age, like information is not wisdom. Storage is not memory, so we have five of those. Um, so I'm going to shift my focus to our book project. Uh, it's under contract with Rutledge, it's due in March. Uh, I'm teaching in the fall, so I need to prepare my syllabi. And yet, I'm still yes, I'm still thinking um, in terms of putting putting a few more songs together that would at least uh, uh, amount to a, a short album, seven songs, eight songs, something like that. Well, that, yeah, would be, and, that would be great. And you never know, um, you know, you mentioned earlier that uh, maybe some sort of idea for a song might come to you in a dream, uh, which I don't think is a, a cliche at all. I mean, it just shows that, that a lot of the creative process can happen in the subconscious, you know, and come to us in a dream or something like that. This is true. Uh, have you had a lot of uh, other songs that you know came to you in a in a dream? Um, that's a good question. Uh, none come to mind. Although I will say that I've had a number of um, experiences in dreams where I'm hearing music that is obviously not music that I had po composed previously and that I had no that no one else had composed previously. But I, I'll hear it. And sometimes I will have uh, woken up and I'm able to recall it, and many times it slips away quickly. That's not the kind of thing. I'll, I've kept dream journals, 
And it's easier to write down notes of, I saw this person, and we were in this place, and we did this. It's right. much more difficult to remember the melody of a song, unless you have a little recorder next to you. But Yes. You know. Which I can't think of which songwriter it is, but I can remember probably 30, 35 years ago, reading an interview with a, a songwriter who said that he, he actually did do that. He kept a little recording yeah, thing good. beside his bed because he dreamed a lot of songs. Well, Billy Joel famously said that uh, River of Dreams uh, came to him in, a dream, in the middle of the night. <laughs> I'm walking it. I mean, it's not a good song, but <laughs> nevertheless. Well, some people <laughs> apparently liked it. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I, okay, I, I shouldn't be ribbing Billy Joel. I like, I, in yeah. fact, I should add Billy Joel to among my influences. His first album, I think, is still my favorite. Billy Joel's first album, Cold Spring Harbor. Uh, that's a great album. You probably know if you're familiar with his biography that when it first came out and he was listening to Cold Spring Harbor as like a li in a listening party, he realized that the record company had recorded it or mastered it at the wrong speed, and it was mm. sped up, so his voice was higher. And you, I mean, I can't imagine how, uh, uh, not just annoyed, like beyond annoyed, I would be uh, enraged. This is my first album, <laughs> the public's gonna hear it, and I sound like a, a freaking chipmunk or whatever on this, <laughs> right? But it's a yeah. great album. It's yeah, got, she's probably. got a way, in fact, I've recorded a number of, um, I mean, you can find this on my YouTube channel. I rec I've recorded a few covers of Billy Joel's songs from that album. Um, cause it's, so, you know, I, okay, I made fun of uh, River of Dreams. I think deservedly so, but Billy Joel. While we're on the topic influence. of YouTube channels, uh, what is, what's the name of your YouTube channel so that people can find it? Oh, I think it's just under my name, Kevin Healy. Kevin Healy. You can look it up, and there I am. Apparently, there's a guy named Kevin Healy, same spelling, who's an expert on autism. And there's another one who's an actor. Any, anything else uh, about your uh, songwriting, your creating, uh, mm -hmm. that you would uh, like to talk about before um, we wrap up? I was thinking in response to your question about the role of dreaming, um, that even though specific melodies don't necessarily come to me in dreams, that line from Timeless Souls Hesitate did, but even though usually the music doesn't come to me in dreams, nevertheless, um, the dream experience and my engagement with my own dream life has had an influence on my creative process. So I've, I have, for as long as I can remember, not, um, not um, as often as I would like, but very often we'll have lucid dreams. So these are dreams where you know that you're dreaming while you're dreaming. So I've read a lot of books about this, and I've done a lot of dream journaling about it. So if, in fact, if I've often thought if people would ask me, if people were to ask me, if I were on Krista Tippett's show on NPR, you know, on being, and she always asks the question, what is your spiritual background or what is your spiritual orientation? It's really dreaming is my spiritual practice. Um, so my engagement with my own dreams, I think, is, is a central, a, a key um, source of my creative um, imagination. Um, the idea of, and I think you can kind of hear this in the atmospherics of a lot of my songs. It's, um, and how I gravitate toward um, sort of psychedelic, uh, aesthetics, kind of otherworldly, very dreamlike, strange imagery sometimes. You know, I'll use delay effects or a lot of reverb or just strange imagery. Um, so I think that comes from my dream journaling. Mm -hmm. It's worth mentioning. Interesting. Well, Kevin Healy, uh, thank you so much for coming on The Creators today. Thank and, you for having uh, me. Uh, it's been a pleasure and...